there. My name's Melissa Carollo. I'm the reference and programming librarian here at Hedberg. And welcome to our program on the Orphan Trains experience. If you have not been to the library before, the restrooms are in the checkout area, just through the security gates and on the left. I'm pleased to be able to introduce author Clark Kidder. In his book, Emily's Story, The Brave Journey of an Orphan Train Rider, he shares the true story of his paternal grandmother, the late Emily Reese Kidder. In 1906, Emily was plucked from the Elizabeth Home for Girls and placed on an orphan train heading west. Mr. Kidder will read excerpts tonight and discuss his book. After the program, he will be available to sign books, and books are available for purchase. So please help me give a warm welcome to Clark Kidder. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. How many have heard of the orphan trains? Quite a few. Anybody here with a descendant or an ancestor, rather, that came out on the train? Yes? And I believe that you had mentioned they were sent to Minnesota. Yes. Okay. And were not treated very well. What? They weren't treated very well. Terrible. Yeah, that's unfortunately... Some were treated nice. Yes. Some were not treated nice. Right. Right. Yeah, that's too bad. Anybody else that had an ancestor that came out? Okay. Um, I had the good fortune of growing up on a uh, large farm in uh, Milton, Wisconsin, with my paternal grandparents, Earl and Emily Kidder. And my grandma used to talk about how she was brought out from Brooklyn, New York on a train and placed in several homes by a minister. And not long after she passed away, I started to hear about these orphan trains, and I thought for sure she must be one of these kids that were brought out on the orphan train. And sure enough, um, the great-great-granddaughter of the minister contacted my aunt in Milton, and she discovered all these journals and scrapbooks that this Reverend Clark had kept, and, and he glued in a picture of my grandmother and uh, had her file number at the Children's Aid Society. And I began to do some research, and about seven years later, got a book put together on her life story. And I'll be reading from the book tonight and uh, showing a lot of historical and family photographs. It was in the late 1840s that immigrants were arriving in New York City by the thousands every day. Abandoned babies were being found on the street at the rate of one every day. At the time that New York City's population was 500,000, it was estimated that there were 10,000 boys and girls living on the streets. This is a typical street scene in uh, the famous Five Points area of New York from uh, about that time. In 1849, New York City's chief of police decided to sound an alarm about what he, uh, and I quote, called the constantly increasing number of vagrant, idle, and vicious children of both sexes who infest our public thoroughfares, hotels, and docks. The city began building institutions to house all these kids, and they became uh, known by such names as Alms House, Home for Little Wanderers, Juvenile Asylum, and Home for Destitute Children. A New York State Commission filed this report in response. They write, The great mass of poor houses are a most disgraceful memorial of the public charity. Common domestic animals are usually more humanely provided for than the paupers in some of these institutions. A minister named Charles Loring Bray, seen here, moved to New York from Connecticut about this time and was appalled by what he seen. Brace was born in 1826 in Litchfield and at a young age moved with his parents to Hartford. He graduated from Yale Divinity School in 1846 and after completing his education he decided that a church ministry uh, uh, would be his calling. He was greatly interested in missionary work and soon found himself working here at the Five Points Mission in New York City. In 1852, at the age of 25, Brace decided that something needed to be done to alleviate New York City's problem of so many destitute and homeless children. He referred to them as the dangerous classes. 
In the Foundling Hospital, which was operated by the city, he found that nine out of 10 of the illegitimate and abandoned babies had died. The truth seems to be, Brace observed, that each infant needs one nurse or caretaker. And if you place these delicate creatures in large companies together in any public building, an immense proportion are sure to die. This muddy street uh, is an example of uh, where many of the kids often had to play back then. In response, Brace founded the, the Children's, Children's Aid Society, Society in, in March of 1854. Soon after, Soon after he formed his society, society, he made this comment. comment. Most, Most touching, touching of all was the crowd of wandering little ones, little ones who immediately found their way to our office. Ragged, ragged young girls who had to wear their hats. Children, children driven, driven from drunkards' homes. Orphans, orphans who slept, slept in a box or on a stairway. Boys cast out by stepmothers and stepfathers. Newsboys whose incessant answer to our question where do you live, rang in our ears. We don't live nowhere. Little boot blacks, young peddlers, canal boys who seem to drift into the city every winter and live a vagabond life. Pickpockets and petty thieves trying to get honest work. Child beggars and flower sellers growing up to enter courses of crime. All this motley throng of infantile misery and childish guilt pass through our doors, telling their stories of suffering and loneliness and temptation until our hearts became sick. It was during a trip to England in 1850 that Brace observed a practice there known as uh, transportation, in which uh, hundreds of England's less desirable citizens were sent to Australia, Cape Town, and North America, a practice that had its origins in the mid-1700s. Brace decided that a similar procedure could be implemented in America to deal with the throngs of homeless children in New York. One of the numerous buildings that Brace founded was this one, the uh, Newsboys Lodging House. It held no less than 1,200 such boys who otherwise would have had to live on the streets. Brace made this comment regarding the placing out of children. He writes, we hope especially to be the means of draining the city of these children by communicating with farmers, manufacturers, or families who have need of such for employment. When homeless boys are found by our agents, we hope to get them into families of respectable, needy persons in the city and put them in the way of an honest living. He later commented that the best asylum of all for the outcast child is the farmer's home. In September 1854, Brace's dream of sending children to new homes in the rural West became a reality when the very first orphan train was sent to Michigan. The society sent 47 boys and girls that year, ages 7 to 15. The uh, American Civil War also left thousands of orphans and half-orphans that ultimately found their way to the orphan trains. During the period following the Civil War, immigrants were arriving in New York at the rate of a thousand every day. On the left is Sister Irene. In 1869, the New York Foundling Home was founded by Sister Mary Irene of the Sisters of Charity. The very day that it opened, a baby was left on their front stoop. Eventually, so many infants were arriving anonymously that a wicker baby buggy was placed in the front lobby to receive them. And this is the buggy that received so many babies. The practice of the Foundling Home differed from that of the Children's Aid Society in that they would have the local priest confirm the name and uh, address of the new foster parents prior to the arrival of the orphan train. They would then pin a piece of paper with a number on the child's chest, such as this one, and uh, sew a piece of cloth onto the inside collar of their coat with the name of the new foster parents on it. This little boy was sent to Dubuque, Iowa in 1885. One new father made this comment. Beats the stork all hollow. 
We asked for a boy of 18 months with brown hair and blue eyes, and the bill was filled to the last specification. Why, the young rascal even has my name tacked on him. <laughs> By the 1870s, the orphan trains of the Children's Aid Society were rolling into more than 30 states. More than 3,000 children a year were being placed in new homes in the country. The peak year came in 1875 when a total of 3,026 children and even a few adults had made the journey westward. The real story of the orphan train era is not one of institutions and policies, but rather the story of those individual children who made the journeys into places unknown and forever changed the landscape of the American West. One of these children happened to be my grandmother, Emily Reese Kidder. Emily's story begins in Brooklyn, New York, where she was born at 5 a.m. on March 28, 1892. She was the tenth child born to her parents, Louis and Laura Reese. The family resided in a small apartment above a store at 1333 Myrtle Avenue. Her father was a shoemaker. Because of circumstances yet unknown, Emily's father deserted the family when Emily was only a few years old. Her mother, Laura, was just unable to care for all of the children herself. One day, a knock at the door would change the lives of the Reese family forever. Authorities from the Brooklyn Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children came calling. This is a photo of some little orphans rounded up in uh, New York from about 1906. Emily and her brother Richard, who was two years her senior, were escorted to the Home for Destitute Children at 217 Sterling Place in Brooklyn. And this is the orphanage my grandmother and her brother were taken to. In a rather ominous looking brick structure, the home was a branch of the Brooklyn Industrial School Association, founded in 1854. Emily and her brother Richard were accounted among the 327 little souls confined to the home when the census was taken in 1900. The children ranged in age from 5 to 12 years. One of Emily's fellow wards at the home was a girl named Mamie Gunderson. Shortly before her death in her late 80s, she recorded many of her memories of her stay in the home in a notebook for her family. Her son Charles, who now lives in Kansas, is enough to share them with me. She writes, The dining room consisted of long, narrow tables like our picnic tables. We sat on stools. At each place was a granite cup of milk and two slices of bread. This was our meal three times a day. With one exception, on visiting days, we had soup. At the, uh, I should go back here, the um, playground that they um, played in, it, was, it had a tall brick wall, and Mamie will tell us about it here in a moment. Uh, it separated the boys from the girls. And this is Mamie Gunderson. Mamie writes, the clothes we wore were all alike. The girls wore plaid dresses with just a plain waist and skirt, long sleeves, and an apron of blue and white check was worn over the dress. We made one change once a week, a clean apron. This is the little uh, group of kids there at the orphanage as they prepared to uh, eat and were saying their prayers. Mamie continues, now in this, in this photo, you'll notice Mamie was just talking about the girls wearing an apron over a, a plaid skirt. You can plainly see that there in the photo. You'll notice the boys are separated on the right side of the room from the girls over here. And the uh, closely cropped hair was due to uh, head lice and ringworm, as I understand it. Mamie continues, we couldn't do any talking at any time only on the playground and in the playroom. One day, as we were looking at our cookbooks and cooking class and following along with the teacher's recipe, 
I missed her say, add vanilla. I said to the girl near me, what did she say that word was? The teacher heard me talking and sent me to the superintendent's office. I had to explain what happened, and she gave me a good scolding, but that was all. But I was really scared. I thought it was going to be a real whipping. When I think of such a trivial thing as that, I wonder what a mother would do if her child had asked her such a question. It really wasn't the question, but I had broken a rule by talking. That was the real punishment. I never forgot. I was just so interested in the recipe that the words just slipped out of my mouth. Mamie continued, we didn't observe many holidays as I remember. Thanksgiving wasn't even thought of as that was a day of feasting. We didn't have anything special. Christmas was the day we had a special treat. Each child had an apple or an orange. No candy or other luxuries. A Christmas tree was placed in the chapel with a few gifts under it. And if the parents didn't come and bring them a gift, then a gift was placed under the tree for them. I remember I got a book on birds one Christmas, and I read that book over and over until I knew it by heart. My mother didn't come that year. I only remember her coming one time. It was soon after I was placed in the orphanage. A girl who stayed in the reception room off from the office called out my name when I was in the playroom one day. I knew what that meant, so I ran up the back stairs, and at the end of a long hall, sitting on a bench, was my mother. I ran up to her, and instead of kissing her or looking at her, I laid, her, laid my head in her lap, and I cried. I guess I was just so overjoyed. I thought she was so beautiful. I had never seen her dressed up before. I can't remember the conversation we had or whether my brothers were there or not. All I can remember is her sweet face. She brought me a silk handkerchief that day, and I still carry it with me. She wrote me a letter after I left the orphanage, but I didn't receive it, as no one in the town where I was sent knew me, and it was placed in the dead letter office. By the time I got the letter, my mother had written that she was going to move in two weeks. I wrote to her right away, but I don't know if she ever received my letter or not. I never heard from her again. Mamie had been placed on an orphan train bound for Rockport, Missouri in 1905. My grandmother Emily also left the home for destitute children that year, but she was not yet placed on an orphan train. She was sent here to the Elizabeth Home for Girls in Manhattan. It was a form of girls' reform school. It was operated by the Children's Aid Society, and the function of the home was once described by Reverend H.D. Clark, one of the placing agents for the society. He writes, This is the home where I sent girls for discipline when they could or would not keep their homes where they were sent. Here they were brought under strict control and taught trades suitable for girls. It was from this home that Emily was sent to a lady in New Rochelle, New York. However, after a short time, the woman deemed Emily unsatisfactory and had her return to the Elizabeth home. Emily was then sent to a Mrs. Hinley for what they called training. One can only imagine what that entailed, but it was customary for the society to teach children how to bathe properly, how to lace their shoes, uh, and to brush their teeth daily. My grandmother often commented about how she was taught how to sew buttonholes, and that probably took place during her stay at the Elizabeth home. On the morning of March 15, 1906, my grandmother was picked up at the Elizabeth home and brought here to the United Charities building in Manhattan. It held the offices of the Children's Aid Society. She was told she'd be taking a train ride to a new home in Hopkinton, Iowa. Emily was to be accompanied by seven other children that had been gathered up from numerous orphanages in the area. The children were all bathed and fitted with a new pair of clothes, as well as coats and mittens to keep them warm on the cold trip west. Each child was allowed to take just one or two keepsakes with them on these trips, and Emily had just one. She had a little brass pin that held a precious photo of her father. Two agents would chaperone the company of children on behalf of the Children's Aid Society, 
Reverend H.D. Clark and Anna Laura Hill. And uh, Reverend Clark is on the left here, Anna Laura Hill on the right, holding a little orphan baby named Bernice Lundergren. She made the trip with my grandmother as well, the little Reverend Clark was born in Plainfield, New York in 1850, and when a young man was blinded in his left eye by a nail that was propelled into it while he was making repairs on their family farm. He was educated at Alfred University in New York and later held pastorates in Iowa, Minnesota, and New York. It was while he held his pastorate in Dodge Center, Minnesota, that he became interested and familiar with the orphan trains. He was put in charge of a local committee that was to take care of a group of orphans being sent there in 1898. Reverend Clark would go on to play a very pivotal role in my grandmother's life. As they prepared to leave the United Charities building that morning, Reverend Clark had Emily and the other children pause for this brief prayer. Lord, these are thy little ones in need, and thou art the God of the orphan. Open the way for these. And with that, they were off. They boarded a ferry boat that would take them to the Erie Railroad and Ferry Terminal in Jersey City, which was about a mile across the river from Manhattan. This is the depot they would have arrived at. They would have a couple of long days and sleepless nights ahead of them as they made the journey westward. The railroads often supplied the Children's Aid Society with special railroad passes that ensured one quarter fare for all under 12 years of age and one half for those older. This is the actual pass that Reverend Clark carried with him for the year 1904. The train was to stop at Chicago on the way to Iowa at the Union Station, and the company of children would have to be transferred to another rail line before they made the journey to Iowa. This is what Union Station looked like the year my grandmother passed through. I've got a great photo of the inside lobby here from that very year. It so happened that Reverend Clark had been contacted in advance by two friends, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Parker of Chicago. They were looking for a young girl to take into their home. Reverend Clark asked them to meet him at Union Station where they could take their pick. After the Parkers talked for some time with a group of children, my grandmother decided that she wanted to go home with them. Reverend Clark gave his, his consent. After Emily left with the Parkers, Reverend Clark and Miss Hill loaded the remaining children into one of these Parmalee buses where they would make their way on to the next railroad station. The buses looked a little different back then. After arriving in Hopkinton, Iowa, Reverend Clark immediately filed a report with the Children's Aid Society regarding my grandmother being left in Chicago. He writes, A friend, C.U. Parker of Chicago, wrote me some time ago about taking a girl. He has no children. He is a fine Christian man and wife of excellent family. He is city inspector of walks. Mr. and Mrs. Parker met us at Union Station, and we talked the matter over. Emily Reese wanted to go home with them, and I gave my consent. She is there on trial and subject to our further investigation. If you know of any Illinois law against it, I can quickly remove her. Mr. Parker is a well-educated man, and I have read fine articles from his pen. If there is any hitch about this procedure, let me know. Emily will have good advantages and refined in Christian influences if she stays in that home. I know as yet nothing of Emily's disposition. This is the little group of kids that my grandma came out with. Uh, she was dropped off in Chicago, of course, and this photo was taken after they arrived in Iowa. So unfortunately, she's not in the photo. Uh, Reverend Clark on back left there and uh, Anna Laura Hill on the back right. After arriving in Hopkinton, the itinerary was typical for each distribution of children, it called for the following. The children would be taken to the Hotel Hopkinton where Reverend Clark and Miss Hill would comb their hair and place ribbons in the hair of the girls. 
At about 10.30 a.m., the children would then be marched to the Hopkinton Masonic Lodge where the distribution was going to take place. The children would then be marched in a semi-circle, or seated rather, in a semi-circle after being marched to the stage. Reverend Clark would speak for about an hour at this point, explaining the goals and expectations of the Children's Aid Society. The children would be asked to step forward one at a time, and the agent would give their name, nationality, or any other traits. On occasion, the children would be asked to perform or sing a song for the audience. Such an event would often draw prospective foster parents from as far away as 30 miles and crowds of upwards of 1,500. One observer in an unidentified western town in 1912 made this comment. The prairie town was as excited as if a convention were in session. Businessmen came to their doors and women hurried to join the parade. 300 interested persons had their attention fixed on the stage and no show troupe ever had such intense attention as did the 14 somewhat frightened little kitties who sat in a row behind the footlights. In the eyes of many women was a glisten of tears. Reverend Clark later recorded his thoughts on placing out children in his journals. He wrote, when a child goes to an industrial school, improvement is seen. And when taken to some good farm home, they are new creatures. Their circumstance and environment is so changed that they too are changed for the better. Their morale is better. Regular work is given to them and they have the care of cows and horses. Girls have chickens to call their own. There is a natural love of animals and there is also discipline and some religious influence, though not always of the highest type but enough to have much influence that hidden tendencies are awakened to goodness. In a short time, they were new boys and girls as compared to the life they were living in the city. These are some of the terms that the children were placed under. It was the policy of the Children's Aid Society to not place brothers and sisters in the same home together. They feared that it would uh, the sibling rivalry would cost them their homes, and it often did. Uh, this caused many tearful separations, of course. They had to agree to keep the kids until they were 18 years of age and clothe them, send them to school. Often very unusual requests uh, were made to the placing agents. This is one of the Dodgers that Reverend Clark would have placed around town or in the newspaper just prior to the arrival of the orphan train. Reverend Clark recorded some of these unusual requests in his journals. He wrote, there were freaks among those who made applications for children. Beauty seemed to be the first consideration or qualification, especially among men. Very many people seemed desirous to have a little pet to show off and doll up. Not having enough children to satisfy all the applicants at New Sharon, Iowa in 1904, I received this request. Mr. Clark, I want a little girl with curly black hair and black eyes, pleasant features, good form, a good singer, oh, and a good memory so as to take part in Sunday school concerts. And she shouldn't have a complexion that will tan or freckle in the sun. I never found the child, writes Reverend Clark. <laughs> he goes on to say, people expect more of an orphan child than they do of their own. Their faults seem greater, are magnified greater. Some people are selfish when they take a child. They just want a pet to show off and doll up and don't want to take any responsibility. When they do, but they expect all will be well and harmonious. And when a fault is seen, they are too ready to send the child back to New York. The stealing of a cookie or the telling of a lie has caused some to lose their homes. I was sent for to take away a boy of 10 years of age for the awful crime of going into the cellar and sticking his fingers in some jelly. Would they send away their own child for that? Asked Reverend Clark. 
he also wrote about a boy that was sent away for swatting a fly and therefore displaying too much aggression in the eyes of his foster parents. Emily had settled in very nicely at her new home with the Parkers in Chicago. She re referred to them as aunt and uncle. But by summer's end, Reverend Clark was summoned to come and replace Emily as Mrs. Parker developed a heart condition and tumor, and they would have to give Emily up. In August 1906, Reverend Clark placed Emily with the Cornelius and Daisy Pelham family of Malone, Iowa. And this is Mr. and Mrs. Pelham. It, they lived in Clinton County, about 18 miles from the Illinois border. The Pelhams farmed 120 acres, and they had a little boy named Arthur, age 7. This is the agreement the Pelhams had to sign when they took my grandmother in. Reverend Clark has typed in the margin that they're not to remove Emily to any hotel or restaurant. Apparently that was a very bad thing back then. Wow. Emily would spend five months at this new home, and in January 1907, Reverend Clark paid them a visit. He found Emily's relationship with the Pelhams fairly agreeable. Emily was attending school and helping with the housework. He writes, A hired girl made some trouble with Emily by quizzing all about her past which Mrs. Pelham thinks was untruthful. Emily did not seem quite as well satisfied as at first, but says she likes the place. She had had some trouble with a little boy in the home, but she does fine in school, says her teacher and Mrs. Pelham. This new home was not to last either. In March 1907, just two months after Reverend Clark's visit, he was summoned by the Pelhams to come back and replace Emily once again because she had quarreled so with Mr. Pelham's little boy and was saucy. Emily was then taken to the home of Sidney and Evelyn Brown of LeClaire, Iowa, located on the west bank of the Mississippi River, about 18 miles southeast of Emily's former home in Malone. Mr. Brown was a carpenter and had two boys, Ralph, age 20, and Clyde, age 18. This is the little depot they would have arrived at on the banks of the Mississippi River there in LeClaire. Reverend Clark filed this report. Mr. Brown's home is pleasant, and the girl seems pleased. Piano in home. And the grown boys appear, he underlines the word appear, gentlemanly. I hope the girl will do better. She didn't. In January 1908, about 10 months after she was placed with the Browns, Reverend Clark was summoned to come and replace her once again. Emily was just two months shy of her 16th birthday at the time. Reverend Clark filed this report. In the home with the Browns at LeClaire, Emily was robbed of her year's schooling and her clothes. She promises to do her best now. Years later in his journals, Reverend Clark recorded some more thoughts on Emily's stay with the Browns. He writes, In the third home she was not well clothed, and again I took her. In doing so, her foster brother in great wrath made enough terrible threats that he thought was going to put me in silence regarding her being mistreated by them. Years later, this young man had charge of a lighthouse in Florida, and he wrote to me asking for forgiveness for his rudeness, but he wanted to know where his only sister he ever had was. This I decided not to give, but I frankly forgave him. This was uh, Mr. Brown from LeClaire. Emily was then off to the home of Edwin and Mary Kellogg of Lansing Township, Alma Key County, Iowa. It was another river town located in extreme northeastern Iowa. The Kelloggs farmed 226 acres and they, that they had rented, and they were in their mid-30s. They had three children, Harold, age 11, Bernice, age 6, and Cecil, age 2. Mr. and Mrs. Kellogg are the couple in the center of the photo, and uh, two of the three children are, are in front of Mrs. Kellogg. Uh, 
A year and five months would pass before Reverend Clark would next visit Emily. He arrived in May 1909. He filed this report. The family talks of moving into Wisconsin, and I will, they will take the girl if I give consent. I gave hearty consent. Not far from the state line. Wisconsin law can't keep a family as, who has moved into the state with a girl from taking, them, taking her with them. Anyway, she's self-supporting. Emily is now a good Christian girl in present form and appearance. It was lucky, and he underlines the word lucky, that I removed her from two past homes and placed her here. Unless we are deceived, she will make a fine woman. She wants to take a nurse's course at a sanitarium, and the Kellogg's will help her. This is an example of one of these reports that Reverend Clark would type up and mail back to the Children's Aid Society. He'd note the distance to the nearest uh, train depot and the nearest school and uh, would take note of the condition of the home and the outbuildings. One night in the fall of 1909, nearly two years after Emily was placed with them, the Kelloggs attended a Seventh-day Adventist camp meeting in the woods near Wakan. All had seemed to be going quite well, but the Kelloggs had other plans. They decided they were leaving that night without Emily. They waited until Emily was out of sight, and they quietly slipped away. Emily searched frantically for them, but to no avail. Finally, one of the men at the meeting recalled seeing the Kellogg's riding off into the night. Emily was taken in by one of the families in the camp, and Reverend Clark was once again coming, summoned to come and replace her. In September 1909, Reverend Clark and Emily boarded a train and headed for the home of Charles and May Mickelson of Milton Junction, Wisconsin. This is what Milton Junction looked like about that time. Reverend Clark had many friends living in the Milton area as Milton was founded by his fellow Seventh-day Baptists. The Mickelsons lived uh, across from the high school about midway between Milton and Milton Junction. They farmed 85 acres and had two boys, Harold, age 13, and Paul, age 5. Reverend Clark filed this report. Ready for high school, the family in Wacon, Iowa, were to move and had no more use for Emily. This new home wanted her, and they will educate her right along in school. I placed her in Wisconsin as a self-supporting girl and for her better education. She thanks me much and is happy over it. We'll need no more visits. Emily attended the Seventh-day Adventist Church with Mrs. Mickelson and was befriended by another local family, the Courtney's. In April of 1910, after living with Mrs. Mickelson for eight months, Emily decided she'd go to work for the Courtney's on their farm just southwest of Milton in Janesville Township. Reverend Clark later recorded this in his journals. He writes, I brought her into Wisconsin to another family of the same faith, and later she was coaxed away from her home by a family of the same church. They urged her to go to South Dakota where their people had a sanitarium. Emily did various chores for the Courtney's, which included hand milking eight cows. She entered and won many baking contests with Mrs. Courtney. They all attended the nearby United Brethren Church, known to the locals as the Sandy Sink Church. It stood about a half mile to the north of the Courtney farm. One day, Emily had to run an errand for the Courtney's and uh, had to come to Janesville. On her way home, she was offered a ride by a fellow named Clark Kidder. He was returning from Janesville where he had gone to sell a load of cordwood to the jail. When he returned home, he remarked to his son Earl, I just met the sweetest young girl with the darkest eyes I've ever seen, and she's really smart. She's just a little bit of a thing. If I were a young man, I'd look her up. And this is what my great-grandfather Clark looked like from about that time. One day, not long after, Mrs. Courtney uh, asked Emily if she'd accompany her to a ladies' aid society meeting at the Clark and Alma Kidder home, which stood about a mile and a half to the north of the Courtney farm. This is the uh, Kidder home. My grandfather's uh, 
little brother and his mom are standing out front. It was at this meeting that Earl was able to meet the girl that his father had spoken so highly of. Earl had just purchased a new rubber-tired buggy at the Northwestern Manufacturing Company in Fort Atkinson and offered to give Emily a ride around the block. Now, this was a country block and amounted to about four miles. <laughs> The only building left standing in Fort is the little office in the far right corner there. Some may recognize that. The rest of it all burnt down. Earl and Emily dated for a short time, but Emily was soon to leave for Chamberlain, South Dakota, where she would study to become a nurse while working at a sanitarium there. This is the sanitarium that she worked at. After a short time there, Emily wrote to Reverend Clark. She writes, Do you think enough of me, Mr. Clark, to help me once more? Reverend Clark later recorded this in his journals. He writes, Arriving there, she found that she was not old enough and did not have enough schooling or enough money for her education. She sent to me for help. She was studying to become a nurse. I sent her $5 to buy school books with and she again started in school. This is what downtown Chamberlain looked like from about that time. Emily stayed six months in Chamberlain and then returned to Milton in January 1912, where she would go to work for the Courtney's once more on their farm. They had written to her asking her to return and help them out. Emily rekindled a relationship with my grandfather Earl, and all was going quite well until the Courtney's decided once again that they no longer needed her help on their farm and urged her to return to South Dakota to the sanitarium. It was soon Sunday evening and time for church at Sandy Sink. About 30 people generally attended services, but on this night there were only two. Earl was the only one to attend from the north and Emily the only one to attend from the south. Services were preached by a circuit-riding minister named Reverend Roberts. You can see him in the uh, rear of the cutter here with the mustache. He made the trek several miles cross-country from Lima Center, just east of Milton. By the time the sermon was over that evening, it had become pitch black outside. There was no moon to illuminate the night sky, and it was in the dead of winter. You could scarcely see your hands in front of your face, as Earl would later recall. Emily was fearful of the long walk home in the dark, and she turned to Earl and said, Oh, Earl, could you please walk me home? It's so very dark out. Sure I can, Earl replied. As they walked down the lane in the direction of the Courtney home, Emily began to cry. Why, what on earth is wrong, Emily asked Earl. I have to go back to South Dakota to work at the sanitarium, and I don't know what I'm going to do. All I do is cook, clean, and dump pots for $4 a week. It's barely enough to buy my clothes, and I have no friends there, and Emily sobbed. Earl pondered for a while and then said, Gosh, I don't know what I can do to help. Emily continued to cry. Can't you please think of something, Earl? Oh, Earl, can't you please think of something, begged Emily. Earl thought for a while as they walked, unsure of just what to say, and then made a startling yet fantastic suggestion. Well, I guess the only thing I could do would be to marry you. <laughs> I'll never forget it, Earl would later recall. <laughs> Emily threw her arms around my neck and jumped off the ground yelling, Oh, will you, will you, will you? Emily's move to South Dakota could be canceled. Emily immediately mailed this postcard to Reverend Clark, who at the time was in charge of a children's home in Cincinnati, Ohio. She writes, Dear friend, received your letter some time ago. I will answer soon. Thought I would let you know that I am expected to be married on March the 27th, or the 27th of this month to Mr. Earl Kidder. Of course, you will be surprised, Emily Reese. March 27th happened to be Emily's birthday.
Earl bought his wedding suit at Seeger's in Milton Junction, seen here, and Emily's dress was hand-sewn by Mrs. Courtney. I've got a nice shot of the interior of Seeger's store there. However, they were actually married a week earlier than Emily had written on the postcard. They were married March 20th, 1912, at the United Brethren Church here in Janesville, with Reverend Roberts officiating. Reverend Clark noted in his journals that he paid them a visit in October of that year and found them very happy. And this is the church that they got married at. It still stands at the corner of Centerway and Milton Avenue. It's kind of a stucco building now and made into apartments. And this is their wedding photo. I've got another real fun wedding photo here, too. <laughs> their uh, sister-in-law, Burl uh, Garthwaite Kidder, is uh, on your left. Earl and Emily spent the first year of their married life in a tent under the Wolf River apple trees at Earl's parents' farm. Earl then converted his father's old granary into their home. The three-room former corn crib seemed like a mansion to the young couple after living in the tent for so long. This is the little granary home that they built in the orchard. Uh, the, the dirt path led, uh, led up to my uh, uh, grandparents, well, Earl's mom and dad's house, the, the old farmhouse. And in the photo is my dad, Warren, with his little cousin, uh, Richard Kidder, in front of him. Earl and Emily then moved to a farm a half mile to the north on Kidder Road where they began to raise a family. They named the farm the Ayrshire Stock Farm. Together they survived the Great Depression and a tornado that blew half the roof off their home. They had three sons and three daughters. Their seventh child, a little boy, was stillborn in 1935. This is Reverend Clark as an elderly gentleman holding one of his little grandchildren. Earl and Emily learned that Reverend Clark had died in Edgerton on Christmas Day, 1928. His obituary read in part, Elder Clark was a man of strong convictions, deep feeling, and unswerving loyalty to his ideals. He was a loyal friend, a loving husband, and a patient, tender father. He had spent his final years at the home of his daughter Mabel in Albion, Wisconsin, spending much of his time corresponding with many of his former wards who looked to him for counsel and encouragement, and in whom he remained interested to the last. He was laid to rest beside his wife Anna in Dodge Center, Minnesota. Anna had died in 1912. By his own estimation, he placed nearly 1,200 children in homes during his employment with the Children's Aid Society, the Children's Home of Cincinnati, Ohio, and the Haskell Home of Battle Creek, Michigan. One of the last entries he made in his journals was this. To my dying day, I shall have the deepest interest in the work of placing and caring for homeless and orphan children. Some dear friends say it was the greatest work of my life. The God of the orphan is the judge of that. The work has brought me great happiness and, in a few cases, great grief or misunderstanding. The thousands of letters from the children all these years testify to the success of it and to their appreciation in so many cases. They will remember him who turned the tides of their lives for the better and for eternity. If God in his mercy shall give me a place in heaven, I hope to see among the redeemed many of these souls who were snatched from poverty and woe and given a home with advantages on earth and grew up respectable citizens. In 1929, my grandmother Emily rode a train back to New York City to meet her family. With the exception of her brother Richard, uh, Emily's brother Lou had located Richard living on uh, Long Island, but he wanted nothing to do with the family. He was just too upset over everything that had taken place. 
Um, my grandmother was, um, you know, upset for a lot of the same reasons. They had uh, several siblings that were quite a bit older than they were when they were placed in the orphanage and even married at the time, and they kind of felt that they should have taken, taken them in instead of placing them in the orphanage. Though he felt uh, no ill will towards my grandmother, Richard did send a photo postcard back of himself to be given to Emily as a keepsake, but for reasons unknown, never again tried to make contact with her. And this is the postcard photograph that he sent back for her. He's in his World War I uniform. Emily's brother Lou had come to visit uh, Earl and Emily a couple times thereafter, and as well as her sister Jane, who had moved to Chicago with her husband. In 1935, Earl was deputized by Rock County Sheriff Jimmy Croak. He would have this job for the next 40 years. In, in 1937, Earl and Emily sold their farm on Kidder Road to their son, Earl Jr. And Earl took a job as caretaker of the Kenneth Parker estate on Bull Road in Hill Township. Parker owned the famous Parker Pen Jane This is an aerial photo taken by Mr. Parker himself of the grounds that my grandparents managed for him. Here, Earl would build two cottages, two stone houses. Uh, he planted plant thousands, thousands of pine trees, trees dig ponds, and raised raise thousands of mink for Mr. Parker. This, this photo was taken by my grandparents in front of the two, two cottages that, that my grandpa built. Uh, grandpa, grandpa was six foot one, one, and grandma was four foot ten, ten, and it really shows. shows. <laughs> <laughs> Tragedies struck in September of 1943. Earl and Emily received a telegram notifying them that their son Don had been killed in a plane crash while on a training flight over all of Kansas. The family was devastated. This is Don here. This is the actual telegram that they received. In the, in the spring, spring of 1946, Earl and Emily purchased a 174-acre farm, farm a few miles, miles southwest, southwest of the Parker estate, estate at the intersection of County Inn and Highway 59 in Adult Township. Earl and Emily's son, Warren, my father, joined them in operating the family farm. Together, they founded the Kidder Farm Market, Fur Company, and the Game Farm, all family businesses that we operated for the next half century. This, this is, is the farm, farm that I grew up on in Milton, and my grandparents uh, lived on. Uh, uh, Grandma's up front, front waiting, waiting on a puzzle where our little melon stand, stand there. Uh, my grandparents lived in the uh, west, west portion of the house that's visible, visible between, between the trees there. there. My, my mom and dad and I and my brother Ron lived on the uh, east, east portion. portion. In the east portion. When, when my, my grandmother applied for Social Security, she had to obtain a copy of her birth certificate. When, when it arrived, she was surprised to learn that she had been celebrating her birthday on a long day, day her entire, entire life. life. <laughs> she, she also learned that she was actually a year older than she thought she was. <laughs> it didn't set too well. <laughs> this, this is my, my grandparents, uh, they, they celebrate uh, their 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, their, their children, children in the back, from left, left to right, are Earl Jr., Jr. or Bubba, as, as we call them, uh, uh, Bernice, Marion, and, and my father, Warren. Losing, Losing details such, such as the day or the year of birth was a pretty common uh, problem that any orphan that had children had to deal with. In, in the spring of 1943, Earl and Emily enjoyed their many grandchildren and great grandchildren. Emily, Emily would never miss a grandchild's or great-grandchild's birthday. birthday. She'd, She'd always send, send a card with a few dollars in it. She knew perhaps more than most <laughs> just how precious the family was. was. And, and this, this is a, a couple of poses of them uh, holding some grandsons. 
even in her advanced, advanced age, my grandmother, Emily, uh, with her mind beginning to falter, uh, to recall her trip on an orphan train, and never again being reunited with her brother Richard. And I've got a video here that's taken uh, not, not long before she passed away, and uh, she's being interviewed about her trip, trip on the train. Where'd you say you were born? In New York. That's what I thought. That's a long ways away. I lived there, there for 12 years. Then I had a, a, a man that picked up in, uh, infant. Well, in, I wasn't an infant, but, but I was in a nursing foster home. Foster home. Yeah. Then I was thinking, take him out of there when you're 12 years old. It was a, a minister that took out kids and placed them in homes when you got 12 years old. You were in an orphanage. My, my brother was 12 years old two years before I was. And he got out. A, 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 rich, a rich couple took him, my brother, Richard. Yeah. I never, never, never saw him or anything after that. What happened to your parents? They both died. Sometime or other, I forgot. But Richard got into a, a rich home, a rich couple adopted him. Yeah. Then he became lieutenant in the war, in the First World War. He got to be a lieutenant, and that was the end of him. I never heard, saw or heard anything more about him. I had a sister, Jane, lived, lived in Chicago. She had his picture, and she gave it to me. I've got a picture of him in my album. I got his picture, but I never, I never saw him alive. The audio is not the best. I hope you were able to hear that okay. In 1983, on the occasion of their 71st wedding anniversary, U.S. Representative John Mansky presented Earl and Emily with a citation from the Assembly of the State of Wisconsin congratulating them on their marital milestone and for their service to people and government in the Milton area. My grandma had fallen and broken her wrist not long before the photo was taken. And this is the certificate that they received. On March 19, 1983, radio personality Paul Harvey announced Earl and Emily's 71st anniversary to the world on his popular radio show. And I've got a recording of that. In today's Tournament of Roses, Emily and Earl Dane Kidder in Milton, Wisconsin, are celebrating 71 years on their way to forever together. Yeah. My grandpa got the biggest kick out of that uh, as the family and friends would stop by the farm that day to uh, celebrate their anniversary. I would play the recording over and over for them. Grandpa says, boy, Mr. Harvey sure is announcing our anniversary an awful lot today. <laughs> In 1985, my grandparents posed with their surviving children as they celebrated their 73rd wedding anniversary. And in back from left to right, or my father, Warren, who was also a police officer like his father, uh, Bernice, Marion, Mildred, and Bub, or Earl Jr. A few months later, Earl had to be hospitalized with a bad heart and other ailments. Though Emily had been suffering from fairly moderate dementia for a few years prior, she had no trouble recognizing him when we took her for a surprise visit to see him at the Edgerton Hospital. Earl knew in his heart that it would be the last time he'd ever see Emily again. As I wheeled Grandma into his room, she spied Grandpa sitting on the edge of his hospital bed and in a barely audible voice said, there's Earl. One of the nurses jokingly asked Earl if he knew who that was. He was visibly choked up and replied with a broken voice, that's my wife, Emily. 
He leaned over to give her a kiss and began to cry. I'd never seen him cry before. He wiped away his tears as Emily looked on. Earl passed away around noon on August 14, 1986. He was 93 years old. He and Emily had been married no less than 74 and a half years. They missed their diamond anniversary by just six months. Though Emily's mind would not enable her to remember that Earl had passed away, it appears that deep in her heart she knew, for she only lasted a few more months herself. I looked in on her on the evening of November 21st, 1986, and found that she had passed away peacefully in her sleep. She was 94 years old. On the dresser next to her bed was the little brass pin that held the precious photo of her father, the one that she had brought with her on the orphan train. She had kept it close to her, cherishing it for over eight decades. And that concludes my story. Thank you. I, thank you. I did bring up the uh, pin that she carried with her on the train, if anyone would like to see it. And I do have copies of my book here that I'd be happy to sign for you at $20 each. Are there any questions I could answer for anyone? Yes. Um, how long into the 1900s did the orphan trains run? They ran from 1854 to 1929. There are... Um, there's about two million people that descend from these orphan train riders, and about a quarter million kids were sent out on the train. I should mention that Reverend Clark traveled about 3,500 rail miles every year visiting these little kids. Yes? Um, you aren't named for Reverend Clark. No, I'm actually named after my great-grandfather, Clark Kidder. Right. Just kind of a coincidence that uh, his last name was was Clark. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Yes. Well, this is just a piece of trivia. As I was watching, I've been to LeClaire, Iowa. That's actually the birthplace of uh, Buffalo Bill Cody. Correct. Yeah. That's they have a nice museum there if you're interested in uh, okay. Mr. Cody's life. You know. I actually would be. I'd like to go down there sometime. It's just north of the uh, Quad Cities. Oh, yes. Beautiful yeah. drive. Uh, well, a great area yeah. from the north or the south. It's okay. A beautiful drive right on okay. Mississippi there. Thank you. Yeah, I'll have to get down there sometime. There was someone over here. Yes. Who financed the, the orphan trains? Well, it was primarily, uh, you know, philanthropic uh, churches. You know, uh, large institutions would fund them. Now, the, the New York Foundling Hospital was uh, founded by the, the sisters, of course, and they took care of all that uh, themselves. Their trains were quite often called the baby trains because they never sent any children out uh, older than three years of age on those. Uh, yes? Why was she turned out so much? She didn't seem like an unruly child. No, no I, it was quite common for these kids to get tossed from one home to the next and then be abused. Uh, the, the parents had, the foster parents had no patience at all, you know. And, of course, Grandma was 14 when she was sent out on this train. And, you know, you can imagine not being able to talk at the orphanage and the regimented lifestyle they had. She was probably a little difficult, too, you know. So, But it was, it went both ways. I just discovered an article in the Milwaukee Journal about a little boy that was terribly abused off the orphan train there. Uh, the foster father had, uh, had embedded lead in the end of a baseball bat and beat him with it. And it was reported, you know, in this article, and he'd gone to court and so forth. But um, the whole experience for these kids was described as like picking out a puppy you know, they, they just, some would get passed over because they didn't look just right or act just right. And you can imagine how traumatizing it must have been. Uh, one little girl, uh, Reverend Clark wrote about one girl that he placed that kept, uh, Reverend had rented a livery in town to bring the little girl out to the farm. And he dropped her off, and each time she came running back down the lane of the farm, grabbing onto the wheels of the buggy, 
saying, please don't leave me. They repeated the scene three times. And on the third time, she held her hands up and said, just go, Mr. Clark, I'll be okay. And the liveryman on the way back to town said, don't ever ask me to go through that again, Reverend Clark. So you can see that it was far from ideal. Um, the New York Foundling children were younger when they were sent out and had a better chance of being adopted because of that. But many of the Children's Aid Society kids were well into their teens and very few were ever adopted. Are there any other questions that I can answer for you here? Anybody? Yes. Well, that was a question that I had. Um, what percentage of these children were adopted? It sounds like they were more like foster children, and some of them probably more like indentured. Yeah, they were more like indentured servants, uh, just uh, help, extra help on the farm. Uh, your uncle or your yeah, your grandmother's brother is your uncle. Right. Was adopted. She said that he was adopted. Yes, he got into a rich, in fact, I've got a picture of him here. Um, thanks to the Social Security Death Index on the Internet, I did a search for every Richard born February 8, 1890 in Brooklyn, New York. There were seven uh, that were, two of them were in the military, so that narrowed it down further because I knew he was in World War I. So I ordered their records, and one of them was just four foot ten, the same height as my grandma, so I thought it had to be him. And I placed some queries on the Internet on various genealogical sites, and sure enough, uh, his adoptive family contacted me and tore this picture right out of their scrapbooks to, and, and sent it to me. He ended up in Baltimore, Maryland, and of all things, served on the uh, United States Railroad Retirement Board and worked for uh, U.S. Customs. Wow. He uh, didn't have any children of his own, but he did have one stepdaughter. He died in 1969 in Baltimore uh, of cancer and uh, unfortunately never was reunited with my grandma. Yes? In uh, Illinois, I think there still is a Children's Aid Society. There were Children's Aid Societies founded here in the Midwest. I think here in Wisconsin it was called the Children's Service Society. Right, right. Each state kind of had their own version, and Chicago had a very large home. Minnesota did uh, exactly. Milwaukee Exactly. Yes. Um, you mentioned that your grandmother was reconnected with a sister who moved to Chicago. Right. And she was the youngest of ten children. So what about the other seven? They remained in Brooklyn, in the Manhattan area. Did your grandmother reconnect with them <coughs> yes. on that visit? She, she did. She and got to meet the entire people family. Ever contacted you? I'm in touch with some of the cousins now. Yeah, yeah. And we're working on the family tree and having a lot of fun with it. Uh, uh, her dad died in 1912 in Brooklyn, uh, the year that she married my Grandpa Earl. But I've never been able to find her mom. She just disappears after the 1900 census. Any other questions uh, that I can answer here? Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I appreciate it. This is one of my favorite pictures of my grandparents. I just added this to the program. Uh, <laughs> it was taken a few years before they passed away. Yeah, it's, it's like American Gothic. That's what I like about it. I may Photoshop a, a pitchfork in there.